various anecdotes and stories out of Joan's life and uh, Peter and Dorothy, who very kindly have organised today, have assured me that everybody here knows all sorts of things about her already and it's not necessary for me to rehearse her very well-known biography. But that said, I did just want to mention that we have many more people attending today who are not in the room, who are enjoying the live stream. And one of those wrote Professor Graham Barker, whom some of you may know, who's a professor of <laughs> archaeology emeritus at Cambridge. And he said, dodgy Wi-Fi permitting, that he is hoping to attend today by live stream from Shan Shanidar Great, um, Cave in Iraqi Kurdistan, where he is excavating right now. So I've got no idea whether he's here or not, but special welcome to you if you managed to get the Wi-Fi to work. Uh, there were some very uh, sweet anecdotes that he sent with his email. Um, but really it was, I guess, the fact that the Kurds treated Joan as absolute royalty and that they were totally enchanted when she gave them colour printouts, uh, I think in 2011, of photos that she'd taken back in uh, the 1960s. And that, I guess, always goes down incredibly well. I know that from my own work. Of course, I have tried to dress as much like an archaeologist today as I <laughs> possibly could to blend in with you. I think that we'll have the chance to mingle again later and go over all the wonderful things that I, I'm hoping you'll be providing to commemorate uh, Joan. Uh, and I do just, before I introduce the first speaker, want to say, of course, a very special welcome to Joan's daughter, Susan, who's with us today. And it's, it's really lovely to see you again. Um, I don't think I've ever seen the chapel as full as it was, probably completely illegally, um, for Joan's service. And that was a very, very touching occasion, especially with all the spring flowers and the music. It was just wonderful. So it's nice to have everyone here again today. I'm now going to hand over straight away to Her Imperial Highness Princess Takamadu of Japan, who has very kindly spent some time recording her contribution. So we're going to go straight into that to start off with. Thanks for coming, everybody, especially those who've come from a long way. Allow me to start by saying how grateful I am to Girton College for having included me in this very special memorial event for Dr. Joan Oates. I went up in 1972. Joan was my director of studies. My first two years went smoothly, by which I mean that my social life had taken off and my spirit for serious study had gone into low gear, but that I had somehow managed to wrinkle my way safely through part one. So my serious talks with Joan are from my third year onwards but I would like to give you a little bit of background, so please bear with me. I was taking part in the Chinese language project, which as far as I can remember, was due to run for five years. The course sounded exciting on paper, but it proved to be quite grueling in practice. It was wide ranging with nine to one classes, five days a week, plus several afternoon classes, and of course, supervisions. Never before had I felt myself so behind in my studies, but I kept my spirits up by setting my sights on Dr. Cheng De Kun's Chinese Art and Archaeology course for my part two. Fate would have it though, that Dr. Cheng would take up a new post at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and leave Cambridge after 23 years. I must say the Chinese department were very generous. They told me that if I still wanted to take the course, it could be arranged for me to study under Professor William Watson in London. But somehow it was not the same, and time-wise, it did not seem feasible. I had little time to think. I opted 
for the Chinese history course. Japan throughout her history has been closely influenced and affected by whatever happens in China, so it seemed a good solution. In hindsight, I suppose it was not a good start. Chinese history was, of course, interesting, but it was simply not giving me the stimulation and satisfaction that seemed to be giving my classmates. After the first term, I had my first long chat with Joan. As you know, Joan was always a good listener, and that conversation was a real lifesaver. Her advice was that unless Chinese was absolutely necessary for my future career, I should take advantage of the tripos system. That's what it's there for, she said, and consider studying something purely out of interest. I chose archaeology and anthropology. Somehow, the pressure was off. The lectures were fascinating, and it felt like a journey into the unknown. When I reported to Joan that I was enjoying it, she just said, good, and gave me a broad Joan smile. Of course, I had to do something about the subjects covered in the first term, because I had missed them altogether. It was not as if they were going to go away. I had to do them in the finals. I borrowed notes, did lots of reading, and I prayed very hard. It worked. I graduated in 1975, a year or two earlier than my Chinese language project classmates, and collected my MA in 1979. Joan told me that she knew that I would do it. Her confidence in me meant everything. In 1984, my engagement to one of the sons of His Imperial Highness Prince Mikasa was announced. Prince Mikasa was an ancient historian specializing in Eastern studies, and I received a delightful letter from Joan. In it, she recalled meeting my father-in-law and reminisced about gathering information about his itinerary whenever he toured sites so as to be able to follow him around. Despite the fact that my father-in-law tried to be very informal and low-key when he moved around as an academic, of course, the authorities would move in the background. Apparently, roads would miraculously appear and sites would become more accessible. Joan caught on to this and took to following in his footsteps with some of her colleagues. My father-in-law remembered Joan well. When I told him the story, he thought it was extremely funny. Fast forward 20 years. I suddenly decided that I should try for a PhD before it was too late. In view of the fact that I serve as the honorary president of BirdLife International, the secretariat of which is in Cambridge, I wondered if I could make some kind of contribution by researching birds and their significance, symbolic or otherwise, in the context of social anthropology or sociology. Joan was all for the idea, but she informed me that we would have to take it in stages. And I would need to produce a shorter paper first before I embarked upon any doctoral work. And she told me, although I did not have to be in Cambridge all the time, I would need to spend at least three months of each year in residence. That would have meant being away from official duties in Japan for a quarter of each year. I gave it some thought and concluded that although the Imperial Household Agency might consider it important for a young princess, they would most certainly not look favorably on it in the case of a full working middle-aged member of the family. Joan, level-headed as always, observed that it was something that I could always do whenever I felt that the timing was right. In 2008, I was offered the chance of writing up a doctoral dissertation on the subject of Netsuke at the Osaka University of Arts, a university at which I serve as a visiting professor. I'd been teaching on the subject of Netscape for a couple of years. I actually, I still am. And I intended to start donating 500 pieces from the Takamado Netsuke collection to the Tokyo National Museum in 2012. The university thought that the collection should be researched properly before it left my hands. There was a part of me that still wanted a Cambridge doctorate, so I discussed this with Joan. She came up with the following. Take it, she said. One doctorate in the hand is worth two in the bush. 
Now for me, these words of wisdom personify the wit and the warmth that made Joan such a lovable person and really show the flexible way in which she always managed to look at things from different angles. She was delighted when I reported that I had safely received my doctorate in 2012. The last time I saw her was in 2019, Gurdon's 150th anniversary, when I went to give the Founders Memorial Lecture. We met up in the orchard where I was planting a tree. She still had the twinkle in her eyes and the broad smile we all remember so well. And I treasure the photos that we had taken then. I miss her, as I'm sure that you all do. She was a very special person who reached out and touched a lot of people. If I were to choose one teacher as being the one who influenced me, me the most, it would without doubt be Joe Notes. She was my director of studies, not just during my college years, but well beyond, and perhaps even now. between speakers simply to give their name, but you've all got the programme. But Jane Grenville has driven all the way from York this morning. We're delighted she's made it, and she's the next on our programme. Thank you very much. <coughs> very nice to see everybody here today. Susie. I arrived at Girton on a completely different day to this. It was, uh, it was very foggy. You couldn't really see your nose in front of your face. Um, and I arrived in January of 1977, having been fished out of the pool. I took my Cambridge entrance exams before A-levels um, and fluffed them, but obviously not so badly that I wasn't invited down to Newnham uh, for an interview, and my brother's girlfriend, who was a second-year anthropologist at Newnham, said, no, don't apply here. You're an archaeologist. This is an anthropology college. You must apply to Girton. I said, I don't want to go to Girton. She said, no, you, you, this is absolutely hiding to nothing. As indeed it turned out, I had a very pleasant interview at Newnham and a very nice no thank you. And a month later, I found myself here, dragged in by my brother, the boyfriend of the Newnham anthropologist, saying, no, you've got to go, and he pushed me in. And there was Joan, with that twinkly smile, and saying, well, I gather you've made a hash of it so far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose I have, really. So we talked about this, and we talked about that, and I said, she said, I see that you've put down, no, this must be 1976. She said, I see that you've put down for a, a 77 entry. And I said, yes, I, I really want to go off and do some digging before I, before I start. And if I'd done seventh term, I would have that chance, and I don't want to miss that chance, so I, I want to take a whole year out. And she said, well... I don't know, this is, this is a fine balance. And I'll tell you what, if, if you will come up straight away this year, that's fine. If you want to come up in 77 and you're absolutely determined to do that, then I think really um, you must reapply and do the exams again. What do you think? And I thought, <laughs> and I said, that doesn't make much sense to me if I'm good enough to do it now. I'm good enough to do it next year. Why do I have to take the exams again? And she said, oh, okay, well, you know, it was nice meeting you. <laughs> and off I went down the corridor to Debbie Swallow, who was, doing, uh, the, who was director of studies for social anthropology, who said, I gather we're not going to have you, but, um, you know, let's have a nice chat. So we did. Uh, and about four days later came the offer. 
And I said to Joan afterwards, you told me at the time you weren't going to take me. Why did you? And she said, well, I just quite liked that bloody-mindedness. <laughs> so, you know, we, we sort of got off to quite a, an interesting and combative start, and we liked each other. I think that was, that was a big thing. I, things that I can remember... Um, I can remember that she was a, a reliable and tolerant and hands-off director of study. She didn't sort of mither us and fuss us, but she was there, which is more than could be said for some of the directors of studies in some of the men's colleges, I might say. Um, and I can remember writing an essay on typology, I think theories of typology, and I'd been to see The Deer Hunter, and my supervision was the next day, and I hadn't written the essay. And the deer hunter freaked me out so much that I sat up all night and wrote the essay. And, and it was returned to me with hardly any comments at all. And at, at the bottom, it just said, I think you should go and see disturbing films more often. This is really rather good. <laughs> <laughs> so she was, yes, she, I... I I worked directly with her in my first year, and then after that I went on to do NBI, Neolithic Bronze and Iron Age, and she just sort of loosely kept tabs on me. And I was living in town, used to come up and see her from time to time just to see, you know, just to touch base and, and check what was going on. Other friends had her as a tutor, and uh, Sue Palmer, who preceded me by a few years in the history department and now lives in York, and is probably here online, and if so, hi, Sue. Uh, she remembers what a very kind, sensitive, and thoughtful tutor she was, and how Sue, as a very nervous and anxious first-termer, she said she found her feet fairly quickly, but in her first term, she was, she was very off hooks, and her grandfather died. And she said Joan was so brilliant at breaking that news to her and just knew exactly how to do it and she's been grateful to her ever since. Um, a more robust Joan was required for my great friend Mary Mark, um, always known as mythical Mary Mark because she was never here, she was always in town with some boy or other. Um, and I, I texted mythical and said, what do you remember? And she one of the things that I remember about Mythical Mary was that she had this absolute terror of a mother who was really fearsome and quite horrible to her. I mean, she, she was, you know, a pretty unpleasant person. And, and Mythical texted me back and said, well, I remember that when I failed my stats exam, she was an economist, when I failed my stats exam at the end of my first year, my mother roared into Cambridge, flinging accusations around all over the place. Joan was the one who saw her off. <laughs> and I thought, yes, I can imagine that. So that, those are my undergraduate memories. Um, I stayed on to, to do a PhD, um, and while I was engaged in that in, in 1983, Joan said, why don't you come to Brock? So uh, I, I did, and I think it was at that point in 83 probably that I would say I became a family friend. Wouldn't you, Susie? That was when we really got to know each other. Let's see if there are a few pictures. Yes, there are. So I know there's going to be lots of pictures of Brock, but I've, I've just got, got some. Um, that's the site from a distance. I gather uh, from a conversation that I was having at lunchtime with Augusta that there's now a sort of equivalent of an Iron Age hill fort on the top of that that was dug by ISIS a few years ago. That's a shame, isn't it? Uh, that was the camp which we all remember. Uh, the outside toilet was here, which was a hole in the ground, and I will um, show you that in a moment, because it's the <laughs> only picture of Joan that I have. Uh, I think you can probably spot David. Uh, I had a trench called FS, Far Sight, right up at the top, uh, and then here are the guys working on it. Uh, Mike Parker Pearson, uh, of alternative fame from uh, Near Eastern archaeology. Uh, he was there that season, and here he is uh, measuring out a trench uh, with, of course, the dog. We had to have a dog, didn't we? This, this dog had attached herself to us. Um, she was uh, not much more than a puppy, uh, and you can see what her colouring is. So she was called Benson and Hedges because she was coloured like a cigarette and always known as Bensoon. 
Uh, and the only picture I have is of Joan at her back, me standing here, David, Susie, there you are, there's Jenny, that guy called Richard James, who did turn up in York a few years ago, looked just the same. And here is Mike Puff Pearson, <laughs> down in the hole, digging out the toilet, which is sitting, the seat sitting here waiting, uh, with a Zemble you see just here to chuck a spoil or two. And that was, that was the only photograph I could find of Joan. But I thought, well, you know, worth having. That said, I found a lovely photograph of Jenny. And I thought that was terrific. That's Jenny and Mike um, looking at pottery. Um, and it is a beautiful picture. And Susie, I'll get you a copy of that. And that's the end of my Brock memories. There are one or two other things I just wanted to, to say. There was a dog in there. Of course, there was always a dog one way or another, and there's always been a dog or two or three in my life as well. But the dog that I remember, I can't remember what her name was, but I remember, oh, was she a black lab? And there was a whole set of Agatha's books on a fairly low bookshelf in the house in Main Street, Barton. And the dog, what was her name? can't remember was attracted to the glue on the spines and all those signed first edition Agatha Christie's <laughs> were chewed up. I do remember that. But the dog, of course, was instantly forgiven. You know, that was not really a problem. They're just books. <laughs> we really met up again much, much later. I went off to York. Uh, I became a medievalist. I was uh, head of the archaeology department at York. Uh, and while I was head of department, my previous, my own head of department, who'd stepped down by that time, Martin Carver, became the editor of Antiquity at the time that Joan was the chair, I think, of the board of Antiquity. And it fell to me to hold the line between Martin on one side wanting to do one thing and Joan on the other side saying, you can't let him do that. And we had an interesting and entertaining three years in which I saw a lot of Joan and we sorted out a lot of issues, but I think antiquity was the better for the fact that Martin had some fairly radical ideas and Joan knew exactly which ones were good and which ones were bad. And I always used to say to students about Martin, you know, this man has 99 ideas a day, which is 98 more ideas than most of us have in a day, and 10% of them are good. Your job is to work out which of them is the 10%. Uh, and, and that was Joan's job as the chair of the Antiquities Trust, uh, the Antiquity Trust, and I think she did it absolutely brilliantly. One of the interesting things, she used to come up to York. Uh, um, we are based in a, a nice sort of Cambridge-y, college-y building called the King's Manor uh, in, the middle of, in the middle of town, which is based on the, uh, the abbot's house of St. Mary's Abbey. So it's a late medieval building with 16th and 17th century additions. Um, and she was very at home in that. But one day she said, but this, this isn't the main university. Take me there. So I took her to Heslington, which is a 1960s concrete uh, campus, and she was so appalled. It was just wonderful. She said, this is everything that I left America to get away from. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I really love it. And she said, I, I don't understand you. How can you like this? And I said, oh, God. So I, I really remember that uh, and, and her absolute astonishment at it and, and the notion that it could be something that one wouldn't be running away from. So um, we had a lot to do with each other then, uh, slightly less than for a few years and then the last time I saw her was uh, about almost exactly 10 years ago actually at the Society of Antiquaries where we were giving a gold, an Antiquaries gold medal to Beatrice de Cardi. Uh, the Secretary of the Council for British Archaeology, and I was Chair of the Trustees of the CBA at that time, uh, and, and Joan was at that. And, and she and I really spent the whole afternoon together 
chatting and catching up, and it was absolutely lovely. I have to say, I just suddenly got an edge at one point. I thought, gosh, you're slipping away from us, aren't you, Joan? And I, I did notice it at that point, but mainly she was, she was on the ball, she knew, uh, you know, she was interested to hear how I was getting on by that time. I was out of the archaeology department and doing things centrally in the university, uh, and it was a really lovely afternoon. Uh, and when I was thinking about this, I, I just Googled to see what was there, and I found that somebody actually made a little film of Beatrice being given her gold medal, and, and Joan and I are standing exactly behind her. So it was a really nice memory of, you know, being there, being together, catching up, having a lovely time, and I thought then how much I miss her, and I'm sure we all do. So uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, Dorothy and Peter, to come and say so. Thank you. Our next speaker has come from Rome. Um, Professor Marcella Frangipane is an old friend of Joan's. Please, we look forward to hearing your memories. So, <clears throat> first of all, I want to thank you and the college and all the person involved for this invitation because it's a really moving occasion for me to be here to remember Joan. I, unfortunately, I couldn't work with her, but I, I know her and we, we had, from the beginning, we met a, a real empathy. So um, I will read my text, sorry, but it's, I'm not speaking in my uh, language, so it, I prefer to do this. Um, so I confirm that it is an honor and great pleasure for me to be here today, so we can, we can move, okay. To remember a scholar who made such a profound impact on archaeological studies. I had fewer opportunities to get to know her than I would have liked. But every time we met at a conference or a meeting, we were immediately on the same wavelength scientifically and as human beings. Many years ago at a conference, she told me, I am here because I heard that you would be attending. And I was moved and also very surprised. From what one could tell on, on first contact, Joan Oates must have been a very strong and determined woman, as she has demonstrated throughout her work as a field and research archaeologist. Yet every time I met her, she always expressed a kindness towards me and towards our work at Aslantepe that translated into beautiful smiles, of which I keep a fond memory. Her determination and strong personality as a scientist and as a woman I think also manifested itself in the extraordinary and fruitful relationship she enjoyed with her lifelong partner and colleague, David Oates. But her friends and collaborators know much about this than I do. Uh, the most important outcome of this intense collaboration and fully shared efforts can be seen in the extra, among other things, of course, in the extraordinary work done by them at Tel Brac. So, um, a site whose study has added fundamental insights to the history of ancient Mesopotamia and which still continues to offer fundamental results and insights thanks to the work of Joan's students, old students, and collaborators and colleagues. I have always been impressed by the strategic skills of Joan and David Oates in dealing with the excavation and investigation of a site that is more than a tell. It is a mountain. 
And I fully realized this when in 2009, we went with some members of the Atlantepe team to visit Tel Brac during a Bayram holiday. Unfortunately, in the absence of John, Augusta, and the other members of the Tel Brac team. It was exciting to look out over the, um, the TW trench, the famous TW trench, and see still there uh, many, sorry, many of the, of the buildings and structures that uh, I have been studied and uh, observed from the publication. There, I perceive the enormous difficulty of dealing strategically in an intelligent way, as Joan uh, and the Telbrac team did, with the excavation of such an immense site, not only in terms of layering, uh, uh, as almost all Near Eastern tells are, but also in terms of sp spatial dimensions, analyzing and understanding the chronology and characteristics uh, of the various overlapping settlements and their relationship. And it was there that I realized uh, how many things John and I had in common in our approach to archaeology, in the goals to be pursued and the difficulties to be faced. First and foremost, patience and the awareness that the archaeological research must involve long time scales and strategies projected into the future if it is to achieve what all archaeological research should aim for, that is the historical reconstruction of phenomena and their in-depth understanding. And this vision, although we have never talked about it, I'm sure has always been at the core of Joan Ott's work accompanied by another awareness that has characterized the quality of her work, that is the need to publish and extensively, as extensively and uh, as in much detail as possible the data obtained and the interpretation given to them. And John knew how to be critical and rigorous um, even with herself and was able to accept ideas and proposals that came from others uh, if she was ultimately convinced that they worked. Two significant examples come to my mind in this regard. The first is the way in which, the, uh, in which she accepted and adopted among the few English speaking uh, colleagues, the use of the Latin term cretula suggested by us in order to overcome the terminological and conceptual confusion that arose from the often unclarified use of terms such as clay ceiling, seal impressions, bulle, and so on. The second more contentious case is Joan's approach to the proposed adoption of a new chronology and terminology to define the phases of the calcolytic period in the uh, extended Mesopotamian world, which had been elaborated by a group of scholars, including myself, in a workshop held in the United States and published in 2001. John was initially very puzzled and critical, and had actually told me that she was not convinced at all when we met in Manchester for a conference. But a few years later, I saw that she has accepted and adopted this terminology in several of her works, demonstrating the thoughtfulness and open-mindedness that is involved in a researcher's ability to change his or her mind. The study of Telbrac and the publication that show it to the scholarly community reflect the way John and the scholars who have worked with her address important and crucial issues, such as the characteristics of urbanism in Northern Mesopotamia, uh, or the question of North-South relations uh, um, in the fourth millennium BC, and the so-called Uruk colonization. In the first case, the work done on the peculiarities of urbanism uh, in, in, uh, in, North Me in Northern Mesopotamia, <coughs> uh, 
uh, and in particular, of course, the territory and the landscape of, of Tel Brac, was of great inspiration, as was the illustration of the relationship between the city and its landscape that is profoundly different from, wha from what is shown by Uruko Arkasite. So this, this was uh, very inspiring for me. It's a real uh, deep analysis of the problem of urbanization in the ancient world. The analysis of the place of Tel Brac in the network of expanding and intensifying relations between North and South communities during the fourth millennium BC was equally clear and rigorous. Such rigorous approach is already recognizable in an old work by John and David in which they address the problem of changes revealing a strong influence or presence of Uruk components in some areas of Brac in the so-called Middle Uruk period. The sentences reproduced here in the slide demonstrates the extreme caution and attention the two scholars gave to the re reliability of the data what leads them to be also cautious in interpreting the existence of a true Uruk colonization at Tel Brac. Colonization that I think as such is, is quite unlikely in such a big site. Also given the importance and power of this site in its region in the fourth millennium. Although obviously one cannot exclude arrivals and presence of small groups from the south or neighboring areas. John and David's absolutely agreeable observation highlights what misunderstandings can arise from an overconfident and understated interpretation of the data of complex phenomena if one does not take into account the often very limited extent of the excavations and their representativeness with respect to the entire site. The excavation we conducted in the early 2000s at Zeytin Libakche on the Middle Euphrates in southeastern Turkey fully confirmed and supported the consistency of these doubts and the need to review the whole phenomenon of Uruk contacts and its vari variability in time and space depending on the different local conditions and actors that were involved. At Zeytin Libakche in a deep trench on the mm, flank of the, of the tail of the mound, we found a continuous sequence from uh, so-called late Chalcolithic three to the beginning of the early Bronze one. In this sequence, as at the neighboring site of Agine B, and as at Tel Brac, I think, there is a sudden change in the archeological materials that show a definitively middle Uruk material culture with the this is the local late Chalcolithic three material, and this is the middle Uruk material in, in the sequence in the same uh, place. Um, with the addition in the last level of this phase of the appearance of a massive cell structure with small rim rimken type mud bricks, identical in all respects, albeit in a small area, to the large warehouse building uh, at Sheikh Hassan. A probable Uruk colony a little farther south. In the later, late Chalcolithic five uh, period, uh, the architecture is, uh, sorry, is small and uh, small scale domestic architecture and the materials reveal a new hybrid culture This is the comparison of the middle, middle Uruk material from all the sites I have mentioned. And this is what happened in the late Chalcolithic five, that is the late Uruk period. So this is the material we have, of course, some examples. In this period, um, the materials reveal a new hybrid culture that has absorbed the Uruk tradition brought to the site in the previous period by re-elaborating it in a local form. Although the excavated area is very small, the data suggests a possible intrusion of Uruk cultural groups, probably from the nearby colonies in the Syrian Middle Euphrates, which certainly had an impact on the local community. 
which nevertheless continued to live their life. And there was most likely no colonization of the entire site. A similar phenomenon may have occurred at Tel Brac without any general colonization of the site, as John and David had brilliantly guessed, even more so since it was a large and powerful regional center. As I have said, even though we did not meet often, a kind of indirect long distance dialogue was established with John. She was certainly inspired by our work on the Atlante Pecretule, as is she also often made explicit, uh, giving um, great uh, importance to the study of the administrative materials of Tel Brac and their location in context. So this is what, um, what she wrote in the publication she gave for Origini, uh, when, where I invited her uh, at a meeting, uh, and this is what she wrote about the uh, results on Atlante Pesilinks and how this inspired um, also her work. At the same time, some of the findings at Tel Brac on uh, gave me food for, fo for thought and comparison when we found comparable findings at Atlantepe. I would like to give here just two interesting examples, and in particular one very suggestive. I had carefully read the publication about the discovery of the monumental building found in levels 1920, as the Augusta well know. <laughs> um, uh, in TW, of course, and I was struck by two details related to the entrance of this building. The large slabs which, which, uh, it was with which it was paved and which resembled those of a similar imposing entrance to a monumental building that was part of the palatial complex at Atlantepe, unfortunately still not entirely brought to light, and the presence of horizontal timbers underneath the floor and underneath these slabs. A similar strange presence of horizontally arranged pa uh, poles had been noted under the floor in the area of the entrance to Temple C at Atlantepe, referable to the pre-palace phase around the mid-fourth uh, millennium BC. Here, however, the area had been damaged by, by modern peats and disturbance, and therefore the interpretation remained uncertain. When in 2016 and 2017, given the poor state of preservation of Temple C, we decided to dismantle it and analyze how it has, had been built, we were faced with a great surprise. The entire building had been built by terracing the area, which is uh, on the edge of the mound, constructing a platform of huge stone slabs all around the central hall of the temple, which in turn rested on horizontal wooden poles. Placed exactly in the same areas as the stones. It had one I had wondered what, uh, what use may have been made of timbers placed horizontally and embedded in a layer of soft mud under such huge stone slabs. And when a tremendous earthquake unfortunately devastated that area of Turkey in 2023, I thought those timbers might have had an anti-seismic function precisely because uh, this was a large and important building that needed to be preserved. After consulting with seismologist colleagues in the Lincei Academy, thanks to them, I discovered that very similar techniques have been adopted today, for example, in Japan. Of course, I do not know whether this was the situation recognized at Tel Brac and whether any extension of the excavation in future would lead to a similar discovery. 
It is a weather food for thought, and the nice thing is that when I consider the Atlantepe case, I always think of John, Augusta, and Telbrac, because this is something that immediately come back to my mind. In addition to the case of the stone threshold, this is uh, some images of how these poles were put under the stones. And they are embedded in mud. And wh when I spoke with the seismologists, they said, uh, yes, this is used, this technique is used, uh, but uh, they don't have to be completely free. Otherwise, the, the, the poles move too much. And in fact, they are not, because they are embedded in mud. So it's exactly the same, uh, the same concept. And this is the, uh, the um, corner of the big building with the same stone slab entrance. And uh, the monumentality of this building is stressed more by the find finding in the corner of a copper door socket. So my esteem for John Ots and our mutual interest uh, in the research carried out at our sites uh, places where we lived in addition to work, that is something important. We archaeologists know what does it mean. Uh, become tangible in the conference celebrating 50 years of excavations at Atlantepe in Rome, to which I invited Joan, and she participated with joy and interest. And it was a further opportunity for intense and relaxed discussion between us and with other colleagues. At that conference, Joan brilliantly presented her ideas and the achievements at Telbrac, confronting them with the Atlantepe results, and vividly acted as chair to other colleagues. Here is uh, the chair of uh, Harald Houtman uh, lecture, and Harald speaking about, uh, again, the comparison with Atlantepe of his site, and with Barbara Elbing and led and participated in discussions with colleagues and young researchers. I'm happy to have promoted this opportunity of meeting because I am sure Joan was also happy to be there, to meet so many colleagues and to talk to young people and students. It was also an opportunity to talk and discuss in a relaxed, informal, and very pleasant atmosphere. Sorry. This is in my house, when we met for dinner after the conference. There is still much to reflect on the great work and contribution that Joan Oates has given to the archaeology and prehistory of the Near East. But I think that the most important lesson that comes from scholars like her is that the greatest scientific contribution is the one that never reaches an end and but sets the path for others to continue. Thank you. Well, Augusta, it's your turn. We keep hearing of Augusta. She herself is now going to talk. Um, she comes to us no longer from Cambridge, though she has been here this week, but from Chicago. We're delighted you're here, Augusta. And I should also like to take this opportunity for, to thank you for all your help in putting this together, because without you, we would not have known where to start. So thank you for that. Good. I think is this actually saying anything? Well, hope so, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Um, let me. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Uh, so, 
Welcome, everyone. Uh, Joan Oates had a profound impact on Mesopotamian archaeology at the University of Cambridge and around the world. Her name is very closely connected with Cambridge, with the MacDonald Institute, with Girton College, and especially with Tel Brock in northeast Syria, the site where she, whoop, mm, didn't mean to do that. Oh, what have I done? I've gone forward multiple, multiple times. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, yeah. And especially with Tel Brock in uh, northeast Syria, the site where she and David began work in 1976, and which held her attention right through the events of 2011 and beyond. So it's a challenge, but a very good one, to summarize her work at Cambridge and at Brock and what she was like as a colleague. So I first met Joan uh, when I was a PhD student in 1992 when she invited me to come to Tel Brock in the following spring. And once I was there, Joan and David, but mostly Joan, put me to work in one of the big third millennium BCE administrative buildings, coincidentally in the other half of a room where Cyprian had excavated the first half in 1990. So that's our names right there in Joan's very distinctive handwriting. Uh, and the locus numbers we used, and I'm glad to see that we are about the same in terms of numbers across the two months. <laughs> we didn't know each other then, <laughs> right? Uh, right, and that's in the inside cover of one of these um, field notebooks that we had. Now, one of my finds in that first se in that season was this nice marble statuette that was on the floor, and I've circled in red uh, my pick mark. Uh, which I created when I found this object, because you have to find things somehow, you have to shift the soil. Um, uh, and anyway, Joan, Joan never let me forget that. And when the, the publication came out, and this is in Brock II, she proudly showed me this. At the, um, anyway, I am not responsible for the missing head. Uh, the head is gone in antiquity, so that's, that's not me. <laughs> but the pick mark I actually you know, consider to be one of my... Sort of, anyway, we'll, we'll just move on. <laughs> anyway, that 1993 season was also memorable for the enormous quantity of rain that we had. Uh, we actually had mushrooms growing in the tents because there was so much rain. Um, and for the continuation of the excavations at these massive third millennium BCE administrative buildings in areas SS and FS, for any of you Mesopotamia following along what we did. Um, and also, uh, it was memorable for this opportunity to visit all the other famous sites in the Upper Habur or Northeast Syrian region, including Tel Bari, Tel Mozan, Tel Hamadiyya, and Tel Halaf, all sites that, you know, as a student I had read about but never had a chance to actually visit. And that was one of Joan's other significant gifts to several generations of younger scholars that she regularly invited to be part of the Tel Brock team over the many, many years. It was incredibly alarming to be driven around by David on rural Syrian roads in a British side drive Land Rover. Uh, and then it was extremely uncomfortable to drag around these muddy sites and have sardine picnics in the rain. But these trips left many of us as our young archeologists with an enduring knowledge of Northeast Syrian landscape, its distinctive topography, uh, its sites and its settlement patterns. And Joan's mission really was education, whether that was lectures, hands-on pottery um, sessions, and so on, or dragging reluctant team members out in the rain to see the Tel Halaf Citadel. I then re-met Joan uh, when I arrived in for the Mesopotamian archaeology position in Cambridge in 1995. And there are two important aspects that I remember of that time. Um, the first was that she very kindly left behind in the <laughs> office that I then moved into, her office, um, this small pile of things like syllabi and maps and chronology charts and other kind of teaching paperwork and so on, with a very nice welcome note um, that said she left them just in case I should find them useful, but she wouldn't be at all upset if I just threw them away. Um, and that was typical of Joan's just extraordinary generosity and her acknowledgement that the field is not static uh, and that it's okay, it's even good uh, each, if each one of us is rapidly left behind by our successors. The second aspect of that time was that, of course, for about three to five years, I had to introduce myself as I'm Joan Oates' successor every single time I met anyone at the University of Cambridge. That includes a time when I was actually locked into the Oriental Studies Library by a colleague, 
Japanese studies, so not our kind. <laughs> um, and I actually had, to, he refused to let me out until I told him who I was and actually invoked Joan's name and offered to have him call her if he, you know, had any concerns. And that's also certainly evidence that Joan was extremely memorable um, and her capacity to network with a wide variety of people across the university. As well. Joan, of course, remained a fellow of the McDonald Institute and was a constant and reliable source of advice and information and support for the rest of the 27 years that I spent here. The Brock Room. Uh, the Brock Room at the McDonald Institute was a reliable and comfortable space for junior and senior colleagues and students over the years for discussions about excavation strategy, lots of talk about Mesopotamian pottery, and of course tea, biscuits, and general support and advice. It was also the repository of decades of excavation records and ceramics from Brock and Tel Rima mainly, um, and from random surface surveys from many sites, the names of which are somehow now lost to time. It was also the repository of several photographs um, from Nimrud, where Joan and David, of course, met in the 1950s while working for Max Madelon. And before I move to the, the significance of Telbrock, um, it's useful to remember that Joan's first love was actually the 6th to 5th millennium BC Ubaid period in southern Mesopotamia in South Iraq. And that was the, um, particularly she looked at the seriation and the international connections of its painted ceramics, and that was the subject of her 1953 dissertation here at Girton College. And one of my very first trips back to the main library at the University of Chicago, I looked up her dissertation, because if you have her dissertation, that's a really good Mesopotamian archaeology library. <laughs> and here it is. This is actually the University of Chicago version of Joan's dissertation. So I'm very happy to say I found it. Now, the, that beginning to her archaeological journey in the Ubaid period um, may explain her insistence on the long-term excavation of Area TW's deep stratigraphic sounding. That cut through many layers from the 2nd millennium, 3rd millennium, 4th millennium BC, and neared but never actually quite reached uh, the Ubaid period, which always remained just like that little bit further away, that little bit further down. So she did find Ubaid in Area CH, but it was a bit messy, so she always yearned to get it at, um, to get it at, at Area TW. And anyway, in her search for the Ubaid at Talbrock, uh, of course, she made other major contributions to our knowledge of many other periods of Mesopotamian history and late prehistory on the way down. So highlights of her research at Brock and the research trajectory there include the study of the contents of the later 2nd millennium BC Mitanni Palace and Temple, which was very ably mapped and analyzed by David, while Joan categorized the ceramics, the glass, and the other material culture, and wove these results into really an archaeology of elite crafting at this time period. Joan was also a major figure in revolutionizing our understanding of a 3rd millennium BC northern Mesopotamia, and Brock in particular in that context. In the Third Millennium BC, the site was ancient Nagar, um, which Joan and David kind of worked out together, um, and was the powerful center of this extended economic and cultural network that reached all the way over to Ebola in western Syria um, and right the way around to southern Mesopotamia or South Iraq. And again, while Joan, uh, while David grappled with the architecture um, and so on, um, these massive buildings and temples, Joan was particularly intrigued by the ceramics, by the cretuli, um, and by the metalwork and other material culture and so on, and by Brock's slightly offbeat and distinctive exports during that time period. And these exports included very highly valued hybrid donkey onager equids uh, and human acrobatic entertainers, both of which are regularly documented in texts as being given or exported to sites over in the, the uh, North Levant, like Abla. And Joan's publication of the trade in these highly valued, valued domesticated animals and the mobility of these acrobatic um, sort of artisans is really a classic example of Cambridge Mesopotamian tradition of combining ancient texts and archaeology, but not in a sort of subtle and unforced way where the two really kind of feed off of each other. Joan's contribution, however, was most distinctive and significant for the fourth millennium BC uh, and the late Calcolithic period, the period in which Brock grew to urban size and saw incredibly complicated socioeconomic developments uh, in terms of migration, mass production, um, and inequality in general. Because the 
sixth and the fifth millennia, Ubay levels remain tantalizingly difficult to reach. Joan embraced the fourth millennium um, and this Uruk Calcolithic period instead and pushed this area of TW excavation deeper and deeper and developed the first and still really the only full ceramic sequence for northern Mesopotamia and this sort of crucial urbanizing um, transitional time period. The sequence then became the baseline for examination of other aspects of urbanism and socioeconomic complexity. At the small scale end, this included a close reading of pot marks on late Calcolithic vessels, which superficially seems like a very minor aspect. You know, some blobs on pottery, how can this be significant? But she managed to work this into something which has huge implications for past communities of practice or learned behaviors and ways of working modes of production in workshops versus industrial areas or household, um, basically household versus industrial area production, and for things like the sharing of resources and labor. So she took this very, very small set of artifacts and built up just this enormously imaginative um, sort of vision of how that actually worked. At the large scale end, going from pot marks to larger scale. Um, Joan's research also comprised significant contributions on the distinctive northern Mesopotamian urbanism, which contrasts what's happening in southern Mesopotamia or South Iraq at roughly the same time, actually probably a little bit later, including identification of this secular power institution to match a very well-established and well-known religious power. So the idea that there are sort of two focus focuses of power, there's secular and religious at the same time. Plus also data for models of mass production of ceramics, other kinds of early administration, and even incipient recording systems well before the actual invention of writing. The complexity of rock in the fourth millennium BC also led Joan to develop the wider rock sustaining area survey for which she embraced the opportunities supplied by cutting edge interpretation of satellite imagery and corona aerial imagery, plus GIS software and GPS receivers, all the while also holding on to established foundational ways of studying ceramics and developing pottery typologies. Joan and David together um, always argued that the long-term occupation of Brock was divide, derived from its central sort of gateway position at the crossroads between east-west and north-south trade routes across this region, and in command of a couple of different river crossings and so on. And the sustaining area survey allowed her and the team to add further nuance to that, which was a kind of dots on a map um, framework including identification of a possible transitional zone between majority uh, nomadic herding and dominant settled farming zones, plus climate change-based variations in settlement pattern over many, many millennia. Joan remained a pottery specialist above all else um, from Nimrud in the 1950s, um, right through Brock in 2011, when she continued to work in the shard yard, counting and sketching and identifying types from her beloved late Calcolithic period. And now I can sort of imagine her saying, well, you know, Augusta, she's a very good archaeologist, but uh, of course she doesn't know anything about late Calcolithic pottery. And I never will know as much as Joan knew, of course, but I promise I am actually working on it. Joan was also, as we've already heard, an early adopter and promoter of slow archaeology, which rejects flashy short-term projects on the sort of trendy theme of the moment in favor of long-term excavation and the gradually accumulating deep knowledge of one particular site and its role within its hinterland and wider region. Her Albert Reckitt archaeological lecture to the British Academy in 2004 exemplifies this slow archaeology approach and the value of investment in long-term research at large multi-period sites. At Cambridge and at Telbrock, Joan was a teacher and a mentor to too many people to count a wise and calm presence through many challenges of academia and fieldwork. <laughs> Sorry, I really, I really miss her. <laughs> thank you all for, thank you to Joan for decades of contribution and, and leadership in the field. And thank you all for coming to celebrate her life.
what a wonderful photo to end with, too. Thank you very much, Augusta. Um, now, Dr. Salam El Kunta has come from Rutgers, from New Jersey, um, and we're looking forward to hearing from one of Joan's more recent protégés. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for uh, Dorothy, Peter, for inviting me and for getting college. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. It's also very emotional uh, as well. Uh, let me see. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Okay, <laughs> I will thank you. In the spring of 2002, in a small office at the Directorate General of Antiquities and Museums in Damascus, my boss at the time, Dr. Michel al um had important guests. Uh, these were Dr. Joan and Dr. David Oates. I just got back from Aleppo, where I was working at the site of Genderis, uh, in Western Olympian countryside, uh, I came and I introduced myself and I said to them, you are uh, uh, what we say in Arabic, more famous than a fire on a landmark. And they smiled and they said, oh, we had this term in Iraq. Uh, I was very excited at the time uh, to even meet them and talk to them as Michel allowed me to do so because he didn't uh, allow many junior people to join important meetings. Um, I met them again uh, at the uh, Seriology Conference uh, in 2003 in London, uh, the annual Seriology Conference, and then when I expressed, I said, I really want uh, to work at Telbrock because Dietrich Zurenhagen, who I worked with at Genderis, told me about Telbrock and how exciting to be there. So I only had <laughs> the opportunity to work then in the, in the 2004. Um, I got to know Joan very closely uh, when I joined the excavation in the spring of 2004 and subsequently when I became a PhD student uh, at Cambridge in uh, the autumn of 2004. It's very difficult for me to fully describe the depth of my connection to Joan and her influence on my life uh, and career, but I will try. Um, Okay. Um, when I was a master's student at Liverpool University, uh, I wanted to, you know, apply and do a PhD in archaeology at, you know, Cambridge with Augusta and Joan at the time, who was retired but also served. Uh, yeah, she was uh, serving as advisor to graduate students. And I came here, and I, uh, before I came, I wanted to work on the third millennium where my heart was, but then when I worked at TW, which you heard a, a lot about today, uh, I fell in love with the fourth millennium, and of course, pre probably I didn't have a chance because Joan decided for me <laughs> that I should work on the fourth millennium. Um, so... Over the next then five, six years, I pursued a PhD dissertation here under the supervision uh, of uh, Augusta, where Joan also uh, served as my academic advisor. Uh, without the support, the academic and fieldwork advice of Joan O's, I wouldn't have been here today, probably. I would have been in Syria in a small office, or God knows where. Um, I will come to talk about the uh, excavation at uh, TW in a bit. So Joan was a, a staunch supporter of women in archaeology and advised and supported a number of Iraqi and Syrian students, uh, both at Cambridge and in the field, uh, many of whom went on to become leading uh, specialists in their fields. She had a great appreciation of the history and contemporary cultures of the Middle East and cultivated scholarly collaboration and friendships with many Syrian and Iraqi archaeologists. Uh, she was a close and uh, a good friend of Dr. Adnan al-Burni, the director of uh, excavation and uh, uh, 
uh, archaeological research in Syria for decades. And uh, she even uh, did, I helped her with the publication she did for in the British Academy for, to, to uh, uh, honor his memory. Uh, he often consulted with them on archaeological decisions, and, and they were, uh, I would say, uh, David and John Oates were the, the very first like Anglophones who worked in Syria because it was predominantly French, uh, mostly. So they were uh, kind of very much appreciated and, and celebrated. Um, Joan's deep knowledge of both southern and northern Mesopotamian archaeology made her one of the very few researchers that uh, Marcella talked about who could easily see trends and ruptures in <coughs> uh, the ancient social cultural history of the region as a whole. Uh, I owe Joan much of my academic training and the way I conduct uh, research and excavate. Joan ki kindly allowed me to work, uh, to work in the BRAC office during my PhD years. I had extensive academic discussions with her that illuminated my thinking and interpretation of the data. I still remember the satisfaction in her eyes when I looked at all the excavation reports of sites in northern Mesopotamia that were relevant to my research. She used to say, only lazy archaeologists read final publications and don't check the site reports. She also used to say, you have to know a bit about everything and a lot about few things. She often referred to Augusta to say, look at Augusta, she knows a lot and she knows pottery, she knows seals, and, uh, and that's the way you should be. Joan, and that's the way she was, but she, she was humbled not to say it. Joan always talked about the significance of Near Eastern archaeology at Cambridge and how we were there from the start. I remember at an afternoon tea uh, time in the McDonald Institute where she introduced me to Colin Renfrew and uh, they had this, you know, heated uh, debates in archaeology. During that conversation, I still remember Joan saying to, uh, she says, Colin, you have the theory, but we have the evidence. <laughs> Joan reviewed and commented on my writings, giving me sharp advice and always guiding me in the right direction. She would graciously correct me and make me feel comfortable expressing my ideas. She always encouraged me and often reminded me to attend archaeological talks at the McDonald Institute and elsewhere. Uh, I was always nervous asking questions in her presence um, and felt very happy when, when she agreed with me. Joan certainly helped me build my self-confidence as a female academic. Joan's vivid memory of her life in Baghdad and stories of past field season at Tal Brak, Nimrud, uh, Tal Rimah, Shogamami, uh, were very much uh, topics of conversations uh, that I find very, found very amusing at the time. I kind of feel glamorous because of Joan. Um, I once was looking at ivory artifacts from Nimrud, um, and Joan would say, oh, these are not clean enough because Agatha insisted on cleaning them. She wasn't good at that, but she insisted. I said, like, she just casually would say that, like, as, like... <laughs> Agatha, okay. Um, our time in the shared yard at Tel Brock was priceless. Joan taught me that shards or shards matter. Our bond over pottery was very strong. And when I say, oh, my master, what do you think about this? And she said, what do you think? Uh, and that gave me like very, uh, you know, this kind of blessing of her. Um, I have a spiritual connection to Tel Brock, even though I worked at so many sites. Um, I often kind of meditated at the Mitanni Palace on the top of Tel Brock um, and told Joan, <coughs> this place is magic. There is no site like this one. And she often joked, she said, when David went to Syria after we moved from Iraq to Syria, I said, the only site I don't want you to come back with is Tel Brock, and he came back with Tel Brock. <laughs> she later, of course, fell in love with it and, and uh, became uh, synonymous with her name. Um, Joan's appreciation of uh, Middle Eastern culture and the people, people of the, the Middle East, in, in particular Syrians and Iraqi, was great. She always 
um, uh, was very kind and generous and respectful. And I remember how one time when we were in Damascus and there were some American archaeologists complaining that the paperwork is taking a long time to process. And then Joan said, these impatient Americans, how dare they? And I said, Joan, you are an American. You just happened to, you, you fell in love with an Englishman. She said, oh, a Cornish man. <laughs> um, so let me talk a little bit about TW. I'll be brief because we, we, you've seen this and there will be similar pictures. So um, that's at the, I used to sit at Tel Brock. I used to sit there next to her. Only this picture, I am third in here uh, because I always wanted to sit next to Joan and hear her stories. Um, Um, let me tell you about TW in particular. So uh, something Marcella and Augusta talked about, but this is the, the um, sequence of the periods that I worked with during my research with Joan, and they were like a core uh, research of hers. Um, Again, as Marcella, Marcella said, she eventually adopted the terminology. She used to, to use the very uh, southern Mesopotamian uh, uh, terminology. So uh, just briefly, if some of you are not familiar with like Mesopotamian debates, we talk always about the South and the North and how the South was greater than the North and how the South controlled the North during what we call the Uruk expansion in the fourth millennium BC. Joan, to be honest, changed that idea. One of the few people who challenged that, with Marcella, of course, being here, and uh, I remember, of course, uh, Germo Algazi, one of the pioneer <coughs> archaeologists who theorized for the Uruk expansion, admitting that Tal Brag and Arslan Tabbe changed his view. And Hamukar, that's my contribution. <laughs> uh, so this is the giant city of Uruk where we know uh, um, civilization started and uh, uh, we, do, we do know a lot about the late Calculithic uh, five period, the end of the fourth millennium, but from Uruk itself, we don't really know very much about the early fourth millennium. We only know it from a s small, deep sounding. Uh, but we know how it became great. So that like process of like, how did we get from like, a, you know, a small town in or the Obeid, which, uh, you know, Joan also started her research from like, chieftain level uh, sites into these fully urbanized sites. And uh, how did we get into writing, right? So here, without going into the further Rook expansion theory, uh, we come to dig a Tal Brock. And we, uh, Tal Brock, in multiple excavation areas and the survey as well revealed that actually urbanism started in southern and northern Mesopotamia probably at equivalent rate, but somehow it was uh, disturbed in the north by the end of the fourth millennium where it really uh, developed into the city states that we know of in the third millennium. And uh, that's again the survey that Augusta talked about and uh, Joan has <coughs> directed and it sees how many sites uh, of the late Calculithic period in the early fourth millennium, uh, late fifth millennium, early fourth millennium uh, thing. And these are, again, the numbers, and you see how they increased sites uh, at Tel Brog. These are all the areas, and that's the size of Tel Brog, which was like about 55 hectares at the time. Uh, TW, which I'll get into in a second. And the idea that I discussed with Joan a lot that how this agglomeration of settlement around Tel Brak uh, came and uh, it became a, a city in the fourth millennium. Uh, TW, which you have seen uh, quite a bit of. Um, I, wouldn't, I mean, this section, I wouldn't tell you how many times I stood there with Joan discussing the section. And that little thing, that was um, the uh, pit with the beveled rim bowls from the, the Uruk, late Uruk period, there was a white owl who lived there, and then Joan will come and say, have you seen the owl today? <laughs> uh, so th this is my, my trench there, and this is uh, uh, the level 20 building, and in front of it, these small rooms that I excavated, actually, Mar Marcella, when I excavated these 
the, the beams. That was the first approval of Joan of me in 2004. I was legit then because I found the beams that were important. This seal, I, you know, they found it. I'm telling you, like my relation with Joan was complex. It was, they found it when in the in the tank in the flotation tank, and I was terrified that Joan was going to kill me because I missed the seal. <laughs> but then she was fine. It happens. Uh, so our, you know, times uh, are priceless at TW. I'm, you know proud to have had the opportunity to work at John and have, I feel privileged also to have had this uh, interaction with her and discussions and advice. And uh, her approval meant a lot to me because believe it or not, she didn't approve of many people in the field. Again, that's the, the trench that you show and thing. And that is a wonderful, that was a very wonderful time when we found this building, which Joan termed the Red Ribbon Building. Um, uh, and we found this evidence for uh, craft specialization at Tel Brock, which we always uh, uh, looked at. They, they were kind of the force for the economic boom in the fourth millennium uh, BC. These are like the, the very cute uh, little production that happened there, and we found both the raw material and the, uh, some of the beads and uh, stuff they, they uh, produced. Again, we found the whole process. These are blanks for these beads that we found that they produce in the Belgium. This one has a particular story, and Augusta remembers that. We found this like weird chalice, which was made of like an obsidian core and like a marble base. I thought it was ugly, I found it. <laughs> but Joan loved it so much that when we um, traveled uh, to Damascus by the end of the season, Augusta remembers that we were on this bus for like 12 hours, and Joan was holding into the, this cold, the cold uh, chalice. I was like, Joan, could I you know, take it from it? No way. She was holding it very, and, and uh, that was a funny one. Again, Augusta talked about potmark, but always very exciting to found a shirt with a potmark because that was Joan's thing. Um, we had many, many memories, and also Joan, these are some of her markments that she named, and they had nicknames, Ahmadain, for example, here. Uh, who was close with with uh, with Joan? She had other uh, workers, Ibrahim, who she would only would want. She will come and say, "I want Ibrahim to find this thing for me." So she will go and like dig a small thing or clarify things herself. But she always requested particular workers that she knows they were good. She was, you know, very much. Uh, uh, she 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 knew a lot of the workmen, and uh, she she kind of. You know, we inherited her system <laughs> in a sense of how we worked. Um, something else about um, Joan also, she was very kind and generous with me. Uh, she gave me gifts. She hosted me in her house. We, I spent the most warm and, and, and memorable Christmas with her and her family, uh, Susie and Jenny and, and their children. Uh, and I felt like uh, I was with my own family. Um, the people in the village, they love Joan and her children. By the way, TW is named after Tom and Walid at Takriti, her Iraqi students. Um, she, there is a girl in the village whose name is Susie. Uh, um, she was very much appreciated and both respected for her work and for her relationship with uh, uh, her husband and her family. Um, I hope, as uh, Joan hoped in the last, our last season, 2011, when Joan was hoping that we will come back, and I wish one day we will be able to go back to Damascus and celebrate the memory of Joan there. Thank you. just dropped my program, but I think our next speaker is Dr. Steve Rennett, um, who is previously of Chicago, but now of the Cambridge Department, um, and works not on Telbrack, I'm told, but on a neighboring area. So thank you, Steve. Let's see. Yeah, 
Uh, well, first of all, thank you, of course, Dorothy and Gurdjian College for, um, and Augusta probably in the organization of inviting me for this event as well. Um, I am Augusta's successor, and I've said that many times this year, and I will be saying that many more years as well, so that, that definitely rung true. And being here today, and what I'll be talking about as well, um, really ingrains the, the weight of the legacy in this position. So um, it's very, very nice to be here today. Um, so I do have some notes that I will be um, cheating from. Um, so Joe Notes contributed greatly to the transition of the field of Mesopotamian archaeology from a culture historical approach in the early 20th century um, to a more modern discipline undergoing um, rapid methodological transformations um, embedded within the countries of Syria, um, Turkey, and Iraq, rather than merely in service to um, the European um, countries. So of course, this takes us really far back. But from my perspective, um, Joan Oates is one of the great names making this large transition and modernizing that field in the second half of the 20th century. Um, my role here today is actually quite different from everybody speaking so far um, because I never had the pleasure to meet Joan, which is really strange um, as you know, this name is so big and I have been working in this now for 20 years, there I say, since I was a young student. So I never actually had the pleasure to meet Joan, let alone work with her. Um, so my role here today is a little bit different where I will Focusing, we'll be, we'll be focusing on how I see at least certain aspects of her legacy on my generation and future generations to come. And to demonstrate that, I decided to highlight five aspects of her legacy and then illustrate this with a few recent publications that I think wouldn't be able to exist without Joan's work. Um, and for this, um, let me see, yeah. Sorry. Okay, so um, in preparation for this talk, I have compiled a quick tally of foreign archaeological projects active in Iraq today. It's not exhaustive, I'm sure I missed several projects, I did a bit of a tally to see who is working um, since about 2010, so the past 15 years in um, the country of Iraq. And so I'm sure, as I, as I said, I've forgotten some of these, but I think this slide does show how vibrant Mesopotamian archaeology again is today, unfortunately, despite many challenges. Um, one topic has, has come up is that Joan, of course, was a trailblazer in the field of Mesopotamian archaeology. Um, I've borrowed the term trailblazer as a website uh, where actually Joan is not represented and I'm hoping maybe we can change that since he has done so much important work in this. Uh, so they are calling this trailblazer um, for the role of women in archaeology. So she came to the field of Mesopotamian archaeology, of course, in the 1950s, 60s, in a very different world than today. Um, her efforts to develop a career in this field, I think especially as a woman at the time, and then to support generations of women, were essential to realize the transformation that um, this field has undergone. So among the projects active in Iraq today and the past 15 years, about 50% now are directed or co-directed by women. And we don't really blink at that. That's normal now, thanks to the work as somebody as Joan Oates. As somebody from a younger generation and standing here, of course, as a white man, um, I very much um, feel that we are indebted to people such as Joan Oates for doing the very hard work for um, making it more a representative field. Um, thinking about Joan's legacy and preparation, um, also for me illustrated that this commitment to a representation in the field, um, including, as we just heard as well, um, really close interact collaboration with the people in the countries where we work, um, really shows to me her holistic approach to Mesopotamian archaeology. So Joan, in my understanding, clearly understood the need for a range of voices in archaeological research and the need for collaboration. Nothing can be understood in isolation, after all. And of course, in part, this approach can be explained within the context of broader changes in the field of archaeology in the 1950s and 60s. But within the field of Mesopotamian studies, Joe Note's research and fieldwork is one of the strongest examples 
of the expansion in Mesopotamian archaeology during the second half of the 20th century. Her first major project in the Mandali region, which I highlighted there in the red um, box, um, is an early example of incorporating regions outside of the traditional course of research, which was really southern Iraq and along the Tigris in the heartland of Assyria at the time. Turning to the eastern frontier, near the edge of the Zagos Mountains, this project explicitly focused on the interaction between these lowlands of Mesopotamia and the Iranian highlands in a completely new way for its time, and combining excavation of one side, Chogamami, with a regional investigation through survey work, which is something that we've also now have seen repeatedly with her work at Tel Brak. The ongoing work today in Iraqi Kurdistan can be understood as a direct continuation of these types of projects in the 1960s, gradually mapping ancient human occupation in regions that have largely been ignored before, combined with targeted excavations to develop a detailed grasp on localized material culture in order to gain a better understanding of the dynamic development of Mesopotamian societies. And so again, all the work in Iraqi Kurdistan, even though we might not always very explicitly realize this, I do think has a lot of um, debt to the work by Joan Oates and several of her colleagues, of course. Um, Joan's special interest in the prehistoric roots of these Mesopotamian societies connected the archaeology of Mesopotamia's urban eras as a direct extension of a long development spanning multiple millennia. Not only did she establish a sequence of the Ubayid period that remains in use today, um, she, in she instigated new directions into research of the region's prehistory that remains very much alive today and continues to develop in new directions. Of all the projects active in Iraq, about 30% now have been set up to investigate explicitly prehistoric periods, Neolithic and Chalcolithic, which again is building on this work um, that Joan Oates and several of her colleagues have achieved um, at that time. Now it's his major um, direction in, in the field. So taking a holistic approach requires the incorporation, of course, of various specialists combining different strands of evidence and integrating our knowledge from different regions within the Mesopotamian world. This approach is now standard within our discipline, uh, but the specific logistics of implementing this took years of dedication, experimentation, and innovation. When looking for examples to design such a project, the Tel Brock project continues as a source of inspiration that can be seen at projects throughout Iraq, either directly implemented by those who are fortunate to participate in fieldwork at Tel Brock, or indirectly adopted as good practice through publications and conversations with those Brock veterans. And even though I haven't worked at Tel Brock, I've benefited greatly from talking to multiple people at Tel Brock, and I'm actually always surprised how many people actually have passed through Tel Brock. So while the stories of rudimentary living conditions at Tel Brock have taken on a life of their own, um, and admittedly are now often heard as a way to stifle complaints by young students in their first experience experiences at archaeological missions. So when people on my project complain about there, something is a bit more rudimentary, I point to Tel Brak and show them some of the pictures. Like, you know, it's, it can be um, th that way as well. But the results of obtaining training at Tel Brak are undeniable when looking at the research and career trajectories of those Brak veterans, which I really think is unmatched in um, the field. So without people such as Joan Oates um, driving forward this field, promoting new researchers, their ideas and proposals for new methodologies, it is difficult to conceive of a Mesopotamian archaeology that would be as vibrant as it is today. Despite numerous challenges of severely reduced academic career opportunities and devastated local infrastructures in the countries of Iraq and Syria. Perhaps even more today than ever before, Joan's commitment to capacity building and investing in the next generation of scholarship should really serve as a model for us all, and that's something that I also very much hope to embrace in this um, position. 
So to illustrate these points, um, I want to highlight a few recent publications that can be identified as direct descendants um, to Joan O's scholarship and some of these researchers who learned directly from Joan at Cambridge or Telbrach and others by researchers who never worked with Joan and might at times only subconsciously funnel her legacy into new research programs. So I selected here one of her many seminal um, articles that tackled the topic of the origins of Ubayid Mesopotamia and its long development as a crucial phase of Mesopotamian history. The structure of this um, study typically includes large pot plates, um, which I combined here with a few um, objects from Trogamami as well, as well as these charts that attempt to visualize how the Ubay transition emerged from interactions between different regions and how this took place, especially over long periods of time. So not really taking a myopic view at the um, results from her work, but really putting that into a much larger context. Um, taking such a synthetic approach to contextualize long-term patterns in Mesopotamian prehistory just has become the norm today, really. Um, so, for example, as I, make, as I mentioned, I made a selection. Um, we have um, an article led by Lamia Khalidi, um, led this study of provenance of the obsidian through the Mesopotamian world to demonstrate the growth of social networks as a structuring force in later prehistory. We have, of course, also the work by Salam al-Kuntar um, at Hotel Hamukar, where I was fortunate to work and maybe indirectly absorb some influence from um, Joan Oates as well. Um, so applying here the collaborative principle and holistic approach of combining site-based excavation with a regional context, thereby, thereby also adding yet another um, of these major early centers so that Tel Brak did not exist in isolation, even though Tel Brak, of course, was very special. In very recent years, I want to highlight, for example, um, this recent publication by Khaled Abu Jayab, who also worked at Tel Brak at some point. Um, I forget when it was exactly, so before 2011, of course. Um, so pulling together all the new data um, with innovative methodologies, but very much continuing the work that Joan Oates began in the 1960s, this new generation of researchers is now able to identify regionalisms within this wider calculatic world. And while these visuals now are more colorful and they build on more robust computational data than the work that Joan Oates was able to do in the 70s and 80s. And the structure and the aim of these studies is very reminiscent and just a direct legacy of Joan Oates' seminal publications. Um, as I mentioned, also young re researchers then who never worked with Joan are focused on similar projects. So highlighting here, for example, recent publication by Luca Volpi, who recently published another study of regionalisms within this Ubayid Mesopotamian world, making extensive use, as Joan did, of ceramic typologies and a sequence first identified by Joan. Um, just, I'm almost there, just kind of want to really put these people in the spotlight. Um, Johnny Baldi's work as well, and again, you see more colorful charts, but ultimately I think this really builds directly um, on Jones' work back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And then I want to maybe end, just kind of do highlight that I am trying to also continue and do my own small part in this process. So this is some slides from my own work at a site called Kani Shai, where we are um, well, I would, it's a much, much smaller site than Tel Brak, and I cannot emphasize enough how much smaller, but to show you, this is where Kani Shai is, and this is where Tel Brak is. We do have the entire sequence as well, and so building on top of, uh, on, on that, on her approach, and taking very similar methodological ap approaches, and also supporting, again, early career scholars in all of this. So in that way, I do think our generation, whether explicitly or sometimes not always fully aware um, are building on this enormous legacy really. And taking the time for this talk today really gave me an opportunity to, to reflect a little bit more actively on that topic. And so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So interesting to hear what's happening today. And now, finally, um, Cyprian, it's a pleasure to welcome back our once-time research mm -hmm. fellow, Cyprian Broodbank, who's now
the director of the Macdonald Institute um, and has also, like so many, it seems, worked at Telbrac. So, Cyprian, Absolutely. thank you. It's all due to Joan. Your last speaker has come all the way from Trumpington, so I'm afraid I, uh, I don't quite share the glamour of, of, and, and the distance of, of, of some of our previous um, speakers. When I first saw the title of this celebratory day, Remembering Joan Oates, my first reaction was, well, how could anyone ever forget Joan Oates, who had ever met her, however briefly, and indeed, who had not even met her? Because, Steve, in your lovely talk just now, you never met her, but you remember her. And I think that is an extraordinary tribute to the reach of this remarkable, remarkable pioneer of the archaeology of Mesopotamia, of archaeology in Cambridge, of archaeology led by women, as has been highlighted, and superbly led, I must say. Well, in a little while, if you'll indulge me, I would like to offer a few of my own memories of Joan and of Brock. And in the sense, Brock, Joan, Joan, Brock, you can see how the two, in a sense, overlap um, and, and exemplify each other in so many ways. But my job, in, really, is to start by um, an appreciation of the appreciators and all the wonderful talks we've had, and to thank them for this extraordinary range. It's been a feast both of memories and of archaeology. Um, as an amateur sitting on the west of Mesopotamia, I've learned a lot today, but also... I've remembered an enormous about, about this extraordinary and wonderful person. Now, in terms of the reach of Joan's academic work, um, and in the sense trying to draw together and thank the speakers we've had today, I thought it might be um, a nice conceit to imagine that we're all sitting at the top of Telbrock before that wretched ISIS hill fort, I think someone called it, but after the exposition of the, the, the discovery of the Mitanni Palace, I don't know whether you're meditating on the top at the time or not, but there we are. Um, I think Marcella said that Brock is not just a site, it's a mountain. And that is true because from its peak, it is a vantage point over enormous expanses of the surrounding landscape. I learned, in fact, I learned all my Mesopotamian geography from sitting on the top of Tel Brock, in effect. Um, and that's probably why it's a bit sketchy, I'm afraid, because uh, that was 1990, and we didn't know that later in that year the invasion of Kuwait was going to happen, and a lot of things began to change. Um, but there we are, and yes, actually, it is so enormous, Brock. We, my first memory of it is arriving after dark in some kind of strange contraption from Hasaki, on a long journey from up from Derazor, and seeing in the headlights these vast contours rearing up ahead of me. And my first thought, genuinely, was that we got horribly lost, we had crossed the border into Turkey, and we were somewhere in the foothills of the Antitaurus Mountains, and that we were in deep, deep trouble, on our way to you, in other words. Um, of course it wasn't, it was Prague, but it is an enormous place. So there we are, together, at the summit, sitting on, what, 4,000 years, or no, 3,500 years um, of, between ourselves and the, and the archaeology we're sitting on. Um, you look south, southeast, as we've been invited to do. You see the Jebel Sinjar, which then was a beautiful kind of pinky grey mountain range, and of course, in 2011, became a refuge um, during the appalling events of that year. Um, and I think, in a sense, one, I'm very grateful for our last two talks. I'm going to go roughly in reverse order, because through them, I think we began to touch upon the reach, the southern reach of Joan. It's partly a result of the length of her life and the length of her influence. So a lot of what we've heard has been about the, the relatively upper levels of her life in Syria. But it starts in Iraq, and it starts with grappling with these huge questions of Mesopotamian culture, Lower Mesopotamian, Central Mesopotamian culture, and life. Um, you swing your view a little bit east, down the line of the Jazeera into the endless haze, to the Tigris somewhere off there, and Hamilcar, which Joan used to talk about as this amazing site that we knew nothing about. And I remember thinking, wow, that's an interesting site. I can't believe here I am today meeting an excavator of Hamilcar, which is fantastic. Um, out to Iraqi Kurdistan, 
and the eastern borders of, Mesop of the peri Mesopotamian world, looking north, past the Tur Abdin, and up into the mountains, the Silver Mountains, maybe, maybe not, of, um, of Mesopotamia texts, um, and the extraordinary connections, um, and the interpretation of those connections, which, as Marcella brought out, Brach was so pivotal for, pivotal for. What is Brach? What is the emergence of urbanism in northern Mesopotamia about? And what are the relations with the communities in what we probably shouldn't be thinking of as a periphery in the mountains, arcing round from the Antitaurus through to the Zagros? And then, of course, looking, and again, in a sense, westward as well, uh, towards Aleppo and towards the whole relationship between northern Mesopotamia and ultimately, I suppose, selfishly for me, the Mediterranean coast and the link-up point with a very different world. So that, in a sense, I hope is more or less a 360-degree view from Brach. But, of course, it didn't end there because we started with a much longer view across the mountains and sea to the what I think Dorothy would call the land of the Hyperboreans, uh, York, and the extraordinary influence um, and, and role of, of Joan in, 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 in your life uh, and in your career, and beyond that, to the land of the rising sun. So this is an extraordinary reach for one scholar. In terms of Joan's qualities, I think what we've all come up with is that they are an extraordinary mixture of one of the most vibrant and wonderful personalities that many of us have ever encountered, and an extraordinary scholar. We've heard a lot about that amazing smile. We've heard a lot about the twinkling blue eyes. I don't think we've heard anything about that lovely, slightly mid-Atlantic burr of her voice, which was highly distinctive. You could hear it coming, and so could the workman at Brock, a long way off. And he knew that Joan was there, and that it would be all right. Joan was a remarkably kind, and wise and tolerant person. We've heard all these wonderful things about her. They're all true in spades. She was also feisty, let's remember that. She was fun, she was feisty, and I think, I think it would be fair to say she could be a tiny, tiny bit scary um, if you were not quite sure you'd done it as well as you should have done um, in your trench, but she was the most wonderful person. And she, as an archeologist, I think what we've heard is that she occupied a pivotal position as the archaeology of Mesopotamia was evolving, like all archaeologies, from being, in a sense, partly the domain of gifted amateurs into being a professionalized, multidisciplinary, scientifically engaged um, practice. Um, she also understood the importance, as many of the speakers have highlighted, of working between material culture and writing, and not prioritizing either, not short-circuiting either, but giving both, in a sense, their, how should we put it, their kind of affording, their affording space, the way in which what they can talk about and can't talk about, and the way in which one can make sensible um, and intelligent relationships or uh, bridges between the two. Um, and in that sense, I mean, I, I remember Joan on, in the Shirt Gardens of Brack. And it really made an enormous impression on me how seriously she took the material culture. Really seriously. And that was, that was inspiring and striking because it's not something in the sense that as someone coming into Mesopotamian archaeology briefly, I perhaps expected. But it was great. It was, it was truly, truly impressive. Um, she was an educator. She was an inspirer of people. And when I say an inspirer, it wasn't simply that she made you feel you could do stuff, but that she made you feel that it was worth you doing that stuff and that you were able to do it and that she would be interested in what you came up with and what you discovered. And she would be critical of it, but she would also see the value of what you were trying to do. And I think many of us, when we were starting, were super unconfident uh, and super in need of that kind of support. Uh, and Joan gave it to us absolutely in spades. So a remarkable, remarkable person. Um, my own memories of Joan are kind of strangely syncopated with decadal kind of gaps in them. Um, I first met her when I, I wouldn't even met her, I just sat in on her lectures because I just arrived in Cambridge to do a PhD on Aegean archeology span and I thought, well, I 
think I really need to know what's happening in the, that big world to the east. So I sat in on some lectures, and they were absolutely riveting. Um, at that stage, I had hit a bit of a kind of buffer in my own work, uh, and had decided to take some time out. And Joan very generously said, well, if you're going to take time out, why not come and dig at Brock? Um, that was... Uh, that was so many people, I think, have had that line. Why not come and dig at Brock? Um, and it's a life-changing experience. It really is. I've talked a little bit about arrival at Brock. Um, the archaeology was just extraordinary. Um, as someone who had been trained in British archaeology and the Aegean archaeology, the idea that you didn't need to worry about your bulk because the wall on one side of your trench was about three metres wide anyway and about four metres tall. Um, was really quite a revelation. The fact that in the backfill of your trench you might find an Uruk tablet. Uh, these were extraordinary things. It was wonderful. And we learned a lot, I think, also about one of the great techniques which Joan was extremely good with, with how to go fast and how to go slow. And when to go, when the confidence to know when you need to actually move stuff and when you need to go extremely carefully. Um, and that was one of the skills... You know, faced with getting down three and a half metres in five weeks. Um, that was the kind of skill you learned. Um, and it was, it's, it's one that uh, has, I hope, stuck with me. Um, there were great stories about Brock. There were great, great stories. Um, Steve, you, um, I actually was one of many who experienced the starvation regime. Um, it was quite funny, actually, because uh, we, we didn't eat very much. In fact, I think we ate the same dinner every night for about six weeks. And it was quite small, um, and there was usually one tomato that was thinly sliced to the number of people uh, who were around the table. And I remember one awful evening when a very large Mesopotamian archaeologist who can't be here today, who would normally be here, was extremely hungry, and I think he slipped two slices of tomato onto his plate, with the result that when the plate came round to the end, there wasn't a slice for someone. Joan went round the table with a fork, she saw where the offending slice was. She pierced it like Poseidon with a trident, <laughs> raised it aloft. I won't say that the big man wept, but he looked very hungry after that. <laughs> it was extraordinary. We were, we, we, we were, although we were living in a world of indigent subsistence farmers all around us, it was rumoured that the Cambridge team was starving. Um, and these poor people would bring in. I remember one brought in a, a boiled egg, rat, rat disguised out of his back, wrapped and smuggled it to me. Um, and because it was well known that, 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 that uh, we were in dire condition, we were in dire need. Um, but this was, this was Joan, because what mattered was the archaeology. And it was character forming, and it was character forming. Um, everything that's been said about the, the wonderful relations with the village and the extraordinary people there uh, are, are absolutely um, ring true to... Uh, to, to, to my memories, um, one of my most uh, one of my strange memories. Yes, you've seen in the background of quite a few of these pictures, quite a few sheep on the tell, and you've also seen, I think, in the first image, the delightful latrines that we all um, had to dig and, uh, and and use for several weeks. And one of my memories is that there was a shepherd who used to drive his sheep across the tell every day. And no matter where we placed the loos with their Hessian screams, he would divert his herd of sheep so that they would take a nibble out of the Hessian, which gradually became more diaphanous and transparent as we went. Um, and we then further, we thought this may just be bad luck, and these, the sheep are also very hungry. Um, but it wasn't that, because what we realized was every time one of us decided to take a trip to the loo, which is a very public march on this sort of bare, bare thing, the shepherd would go a little bit further up the tell and watch <laughs> through the increasingly transparent Hessian what was going on inside. So we had, we had a lot, of, we had a lot of, of good memories. In fact, I have to say I've worked on a lot of sites since then. <laughs> Wonderful memories. And I, I honestly think, I don't know about anyone else in this room, but I think, honestly, one dines out more on stories about Brock um, than all of the rest of them. Good stories, fun stories, stories that make you laugh, stories that make you really assert your faith in the extraordinary nature of humanity. Um, I left Brant precipitately at the end. Uh, I wasn't fired. Um, but it's a story about Joan. Um, Joan had realised that I needed another year's funding to finish my PhD. She had suggested just before I left that I apply for a one-year scholarship 
at this wonderful college. And I'd put that in, and I'd never given it really a moment's more thought, but I got on the plane, gone to Jordan, travelled around Jordan and Syria, ended up at Prague, and one day a letter arrived. And this letter, this was before email, of course, this letter had been sent by Girton College. It had been sent to my parents' address in London, and it had been sent on to Hasaki, and by some way or other it had arrived in Prague. And it said, congratulations, you have an interview for this um, one-year scholarship. Oh, that's great. And I flicked on this. It said, and the interview is, and the date was tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and it was Joan. It was amazing. Joan, Joan just fixed it. I was packed onto a train to Aleppo. I was on a flight. She somehow managed to communicate with the college that could they give me two more days, please? Um, so within three days, I think I weighed nine stone. I was so brown that my supervisor didn't recognize me. Walked into the room. There was Dorothy. Joan, of course, was doing her wonderful stuff. There was Dorothy and Chris Chippendale and one or two others. And uh, I must have ranted wildly, I think, having not slept very much. And um, yeah. And I didn't see much of Joan again until another terrifying moment when I was being interviewed for the job I got here in 2013. Scary audience, very scary audience. And uh, there was a pair of twinkling blue eyes in the second row. I kind of knew it would be all right then. An amazing person. She could make you feel it was going to be all right. So, in a sense, both for myself, but I hope on behalf of all our speakers and audience, an incredibly warm thanks to Girton for everything it's done to allow us to celebrate jo Joan in this wonderful way. I would like to say to Dorothy, both of you, in fact, for um, everything you've done to keep Joan's memory warm and vibrant with us, and most of all to Joan for really being an example of how to be an extraordinary scholar and human being, how to be a wonderful person, and to live on in our memories for many, many years to come with joy and happiness. So thank you. Cyprian, thank you. Um, just before we go, um, and there are drinks across in Old Hall, to which everyone is invited, of course, um, there are a lot of thanks that I want to make. Um, the first thanks, actually, Cyprian, are also to the MacDonald, um, the help from the MacDonald, the financial help towards today, has been enormously appreciated. Um, in the mistress's office, I want to thank Michelle and Rachel, whose work has made the job that Peter and I have been doing tolerable and light. They have done a fantastic job. To all the college staff who have been involved in getting the drinks, putting up the labels, making sure that today runs well. Runs well. But most of all, it's the speakers who've been addressing us today. It's been so nice to have Joan brought back to us, um, and we're enormously grateful to you all, and especially also to Augusta for helping us get our programme, because we would not have known how to do it without that. So thank you all, and let's go and celebrate. Thank you. Thank you.